Our passage this morning is uh, sort of a break from what we've gotten used to in Matthew. We're in Matthew 10, verses 1 through 4. Uh, and it's sort of different from what we've been doing because most of what we've been reading in Matthew has been what we would classify as narrative, where Matthew sort of played the narrator, narrating and telling us stories about specific events and episodes from Jesus' life. There's a little bit of that today at the very beginning, but mainly Matthew stops in the middle of his narrative to introduce us to Jesus' 12 disciples. He goes through, lists their names, so we know who exactly makes up the 12. That's the sort of cool nickname that Luke and Mark give to the 12 disciples, the 12. I bet they thought that was so cool. But these 12 men, they they were known and they were distinguished from all the rest of the faithful and dedicated disciples of Jesus. They were close to Jesus. They walked with him. They lived life with him. They were in community with him. And so this morning, Matthew stops to introduce us to them as they're actually about to be sent out by Jesus to share the gospel in the surrounding region of Galilee. But that's not next week. Uh, for today, we're going to see three things in this list of Jesus's 12 disciples. Three things. Number one, Jesus' disciples are called to be doers of the word, not hearers only. They're called to be doers of the word, not hearers only. Number two, Jesus' disciples are weak and ordinary. And finally, number three, we must embrace our weakness and not neglect the ordinary works of faithfulness. Okay? We'll see these again, so you don't have to write them all down. We'll get back to them. That's what we're going to be doing today. Let's pray for our time and then get into our text this morning. Father, we thank you uh, for your grace. We're thankful for the gift of of the church. Uh, We thank you that you you give us a community to, uh, to learn alongside of. And we thank you for the establishment of your church, these, these 12 men uh, so long ago. And we seek to follow in their example, well, 11 of them. And uh, I pray, Lord, that you would strengthen our faith this morning, uh, Lord, that you would, you would remove distractions from us, and uh, that we would hear your word proclaimed. Um, we thank you for your abundant grace. We know we, we need your grace. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. So let's begin this morning, Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, which says, And he called to him, Jesus called to him his 12 disciples, or 12 apostles, and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. And so Jesus calls his disciples to himself, and he gives them a particular type of authority. Okay, if you remember, the authority of Jesus has been a huge theme throughout the book of Matthew. Everywhere Jesus goes, these crowds are left marveling at his authority, particularly because Jesus appears to have an authority that's on par with the authority of God. And they're like, who is this guy? You know, how, how is it that he seems to wield such authority? Authority over demons, over nature, wind and waves on the Sea of Galilee, over diseases and sickness. He can even raise the dead to life. We saw that a few weeks ago. Only God has this type of authority. So all the crowds are amazed. But this morning, we see him take some of that divine authority, and he gives it to the 12. Specifically, he gives them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. Why? Why does he give them this authority? Well, this requires a little bit of Bible study, so hopefully you won't mind. But if you're looking there in your Bible, or you're looking at your phone with your Bible on it, uh, just look a few verses above ours this morning. We, we sometimes miss this when we break the Bible up into little sermon segments. But look a few verses up in Matthew chapter 9, verses 32 through 33. Just a few verses above. And pay attention to what Jesus does. It says, As they were going away, behold, a demon-oppressed man who was mute was brought to him. And when the demon had been cast out, the mute man Spoke, And the crowds marveled, saying, never was anything like this seen in Israel. Okay, so Jesus used his authority to what? To cast out an unclean spirit. And then just two verses later, that's our text from last week, Matthew 9, 35, says that Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and 
healing every disease and every affliction. And so Jesus is casting out unclean spirits, and he's healing every disease and every affliction. And now this morning, he gives his disciples the authority to do those things as well. And here's why. Notice in verse 35, 935, as he's going around doing these things, he's also proclaiming something. Do you see that? It says that he is teaching in the synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. Now, here's what Jesus knows to be true. Proclamation means nothing without demonstration. Okay? Proclamation means nothing without demonstration. If you proclaim you're the greatest guitarist to ever live, that's a great proclamation. Amazing. Good for you. But then I'm going to hand you a guitar, and I'm going to wait for some demonstration. Because your proclamation, that means nothing unless there's demonstration. And likewise, Jesus is going around proclaiming, the kingdom of God is at hand. That's great. That's, that's awesome. What a wonderful proclamation. But only God can make that sort of proclamation. God decides when his kingdom is at hand. And so naturally, people are looking for some sort of demonstration. Show us that you can back up this proclamation. And so what does Jesus do? He casts out unclean spirits. He heals every disease and affliction. And so just think back to the story from a few weeks ago when a paralyzed man is lowered in front of Jesus from a roof. And Jesus told the man, your sins are forgiven. Now, the religious leaders, they thought, hey, only God has the authority to forgive sins. That's quite the proclamation, they're thinking. And so Jesus turns to them and he says, you know, so that you know I have the authority to forgive sins, I'll tell this paralyzed man to rise and walk. And so Jesus demonstrates that he, in fact, does have that authority to make that sort of proclamation. So Jesus understood proclamation means nothing without demonstration. So now in Matthew 10, Jesus is preparing to send his disciples out, sending them out to make the same proclamation that he's been making, that the kingdom of God is at hand, that the Messiah, the Savior of the world has come. Repent and believe in the gospel. And so it says, he gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. He gives them his demonstration of authority so that his disciples' proclamation can be validated, so it can be demonstrated. Now, you may not recognize this at first, but this authority Jesus is giving to his disciples, it actually implies some. It points to a, a very basic truth about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And that's actually our first point today. Jesus' disciples, number one, Jesus' disciples are called to be doers of the word, not hearers only. Jesus' disciples are called to be doers of the word, not hearers only. So we need to step back and realize that Jesus is giving his disciples authority so that they might do something with it. He's not giving them authority just so they feel a little bit elevated above the rest of the people following Jesus around Galilee. Jesus is giving them this authority so that they will do something with it. Because what good is the authority over unclean spirits and the authority to heal every disease and every affliction if all the disciples were planning on doing was just sitting around in a circle together discussing the brilliance of Jesus' parables? What's the point? Why would Jesus give them this authority if he only expected them to be some sort of spiritual book club that got together the ooh and ah over Jesus' wisdom and power and love? What I'm getting at is what good is the authority Jesus gives his disciples if they simply hear his teaching, but then they don't proclaim it or demonstrate it in their lives? So Jesus calls his disciples to do, not to simply hear. He calls them to work like a laborer in a field, is what Jesus said last week. Next week, he'll say, proclaim the kingdom of God is at hand, and he'll command them to heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons, etc., and so to be a disciple of Jesus is to be a doer of Jesus' commands, not a hearer only. It's to advance and proclaim the kingdom of God, not simply consume the kingdom for yourself. And that's just as true for us today as it was for his 12 disciples then. The Christian life is not one of, uh, of sitting in a room on Sundays to ooh and ah over how nice God is to us. Rather, there's work to be done. 
We're called to proclaim the kingdom of God, to proclaim the good news that God has redeemed the hopeless and he does still redeem the hopeless and saves the lost and that he's making all things new. God has entrusted us, the church, with this mission. We are the laborers in the harvest. And so Jesus' disciples are called to be doers of the word, not hearers only. A question for us this morning is, are you doing the work Jesus has set before us, the church? Or are you simply here to consume? Are you here to like listen to a, is this like a podcast just live, you know? That's why you get mad when it goes long and you can't pause it or stop it. Just close it like all your other podcasts. Or are you here to do the faithful work that's been given, commanded by Jesus to all Christians? Because if you want a podcast, there's a lot you can listen to with better preaching, better music. We could recommend some. You can just go home and listen to it. But that's not what any of this is about. I do want to spend more time on this, and we will at the end, so we'll just to put a pin in it for now. But we're called to be doers of the word, not hearers only, not simply podcast listeners who really value good theology and good teaching. Are you doing the work or is your Christianity characterized by consumption? I'm getting ahead. We'll go back. I want to talk about the 12 disciples, okay, who are called to be doers of the word. So let's continue with verses two through four, which says... The names of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. So Matthew takes the time to list out all the names of these men who comprise the 12, because most of these guys, are, they're leaders in the church in the first century. And as Christianity spreads, it's helpful to know who to go to, who you can ask if you, if you have a question. And so Matthew gives us their names to sort of endorse or affirm the leadership of these men, except for Judas, obviously. That's a nice burn there at the end. Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. <laughs> okay. But a quick note, you'll see all of these guys are paired up. Do you notice that? They're all kind of put into pairs. And that's because uh, in the book of Mark, Mark tells us that Jesus is actually sending them out in pairs. Okay? So that's why they're paired off together. Jesus is a fan of the buddy system. All right? And so everyone's got their buddy. And a lot of these guys are brothers, and so they're naturally going to kind of buddy up. Now, I want to walk through this list. uh, And you'll notice some of these names we recognize, but... Probably a lot of them we don't, right? Like, what can you tell me about Thaddeus, except that he has a terrible name? (laughs) Or what can you tell me about James, son of Alphaeus? Okay, but but here's what we're going to see as we walk through these names, which is our second point. Not only are Jesus' disciples called to be doers of the word, not hearers only, but number two, Jesus' disciples are weak and ordinary. They're weak and ordinary. These guys are not extraordinary, ambitious, brilliant, or anything to marvel about. They're quite ordinary. In fact, some, if not most of them, are so ordinary, outside of the basic list of the 12 apostles, there's nothing else said about them. That's why you don't know who Thaddeus is or Simon the Zealot, because apparently there's not much to say. This isn't a knock on them. You know, it's not bad to be ordinary. I'll try to convince you in this sermon that it's actually a very good thing to be ordinary. Let me give you an example. How many of you in the room are Dallas Cowboys fans? Is that real? No. Can you, like, raise your hands real high? Is this the state of of Dallas Cowboys fandom? Okay, see more of them. Man, how embarrassing for you guys. You're like, oh, man, I'm so sorry. Okay, so... We have a, maybe a few, a small fraction, a remnant of Dallas Cowboys fans. I, I hate the Cowboys. I'm not a Cowboys fan. <laughs> but I thought more of you would be. Okay, so I want y'all, you know, because you're so bold, apparently, I want you guys to yell out the name of the starting quarterback for the Cowboys. <laughs> Amen, brother. Yeah. Okay. Of all things to be ashamed of, that guy. But y'all yelled it out. Thank you for participating. Now, here's what I want you to do. Everyone yell out the name of their starting right guard. 
I thought y'all were fans. Where'd it go? No, my point is, the reason you don't know his name is because of his role. He's a right guard. He's not meant to be noticed. He certainly has a job to do, but he's not meant to be something extraordinary. If you notice him, it's because he did something wrong. Likewise, the role in the ministry of most of the disciples was not to be out in front of the crowds, okay, but instead to serve as humble, ordinary servants to this growing first century church. They were ordinary people. New Testament commentator Leon Morris writes, when Jesus chose his 12, he did not choose supermen. God does not need outstanding people to do his work. And it seems that while some of the 12 were very able men, others were very ordinary. And I'd actually say, I'd go on to say, all of Jesus' disciples were quite ordinary. But at the same time, there was a quarterback, okay, of the disciples, and that was Peter. Peter, who's listed first here for that reason. He became their leader, the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And there were a few other guys who took charge and exhibited a little bit more leadership, guys like James and John, who we're more familiar with. But the funny thing about these guys, the ones who are more in the spotlight, is what did the spotlight tend to reveal most about them? That they were weak. They were not powerhouses of godliness, that they were sinful, obstinate, arrogant, selfish, unfaithful, cowardly. They were weak. But notice, these are exactly the sort of people that Jesus calls to himself. Like he said, the healthy don't need a physician. Jesus came to heal the sick. And these 12 men he called to serve as living examples of what it looks like to be sick and yet receive healing from the great physician. Jesus' disciples are weak and ordinary. Now, with that in mind, let me walk through this list, kind of actually out of order. I want to focus on the more ordinary of these guys first, and then we'll go to the top and talk about the more out in front guys, and we'll highlight their weaknesses. So I'm kind of going to go in reverse order, but then I'm going to talk about Judas last, so not really, but it'll be highlighted on the screen, so you'll know where I'm at, okay? So first, we're going to look at James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, and Simon the Zealot. I put all these together because these are the guys we know the least about, okay? These are the right guard, left guard, and defensive end for the Dallas Cowboys, I think. I think that's actually their names, so. <laughs> but we know next to nothing about them. Here's what we do know. It's, it's likely that James, son of Alphaeus, is actually Matthew, the tax collector's brother. Matthew, whose words we're reading this morning, his brother. Because Matthew, in his own book, refers to himself as Matthew, but Mark, at one point, refers to him as Levi, son of Alphaeus, okay? So it, it's, it's safe to assume that it's possible James, son of Alphaeus, was Matthew's brother. That's a fun little fun fact. Bring that out at parties. All of you bold, you know, obviously very bold people, so that's probably the fun fact you would bring. Uh, now, look at Thaddeus, which is a terrible name, okay? But luckily for Thaddeus, it's common in Jesus' day to go by multiple names, you know, depending on what crowd you're with or what language they spoke. So you'd think with a terrible name like Thaddeus, he probably just went by some other name, which was way cooler and way better. And socially, you kind of raise up his status. Nope, his other name was Judas, which is, you know, if you know, pretty rough, okay? So Thaddeus it is, right? I love what John does in his gospel. He writes about poor Thaddeus. John 14, 22, he says, he refers to him, he says, Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, <laughs> which is awful <laughs> to just be this little parenthetical. So, you know, I'd go by Thaddeus too, poor guy. It's like having the name Adolf, you know. I got a friend who wrote a really insightful book named Adolf, and you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's like, well, not Hitler. I mean, no, you know, poor guy. But that's about it on Thaddeus slash Judas, okay? Not Iscariot. And then there's Simon the Zealot. And that nickname, it might reveal a political past. Uh, he might have originally been part of some extremist group of Israelites, sort of ultra, you know, burn down Rome, you know, all sort of guy. But really that nickname just here, it just serves to distinguish him from Simon Peter, you know. There's a lot of multiple names going on, which can get confusing. But these three guys are ordinary, okay? Nothing to write home about, but faithful, humble disciples called by Jesus, and if I can give a quick sidebar, nobody strives to be like these guys. 
When you read this list of guys, you're going to be like, yeah, man, Thaddeus is my guy. No one wants to be at the bottom of a list. No one wants to be the, the footnote uh, in a church. But I wish these guys were our heroes because in the past decade in American churches, churches across America, especially here in the Bible Belt, it's revealed that when Christians want so desperately to be seen as bold leaders like Peter and James and John, they'll sacrifice everything on the altar of getting their, their name in the spiritual leader, leader spotlight. They'll sacrifice spiritual health of their people. They'll sacrifice personal holiness, accountability, humility, and churches everywhere are suffering as a result. So strive to be like James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Zealot, quietly serving faithfully advancing the kingdom, just a footnote today, yes, but eternal glory is theirs forever, and we owe the faith that we have received to these men. So make these guys your heroes. Sidebar over. Next, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. Not much is known about Thomas, but what is known is that he doubted. Okay, he's a doubting Thomas. After Jesus had been raised from the dead, some of the other disciples, they told, Jesus, or told uh, Thomas that Jesus was alive. And Thomas said, unless I see it for myself, unless I can put my, actually touch his wounds, I'll never believe. That's what he said. He said, no, I'll believe when I see it. No, he didn't say that. He said, I will never believe unless this happens. And then he didn't see Jesus for eight days. Okay, Thomas goes on in that state of mind, eight days, thinking Jesus is dead. So I guess that was a waste of time, all of that. And he doesn't go to Jesus, doesn't seem like it. Jesus actually has to come to him. He approaches him. And then when he sees Jesus, he believes. Some believe that Thomas eventually carried the gospel to India, where he was martyred. Others believe he went to Persia, ministered there. We don't for sure know. And then we have Matthew, the man credited with writing the book we've been studying. Uh, Matthew, the tax collector, he adds, referring to this, his former life as a tax collector. And it's sort of this self-deprecating way of giving us everything we need to know about his character. Because you would have to be a greedy, corrupt, and uncompassionate person to work as a tax collector for the Roman government. Tax collectors were, were Jewish men, were Jews who enriched themselves by serving the oppressive Roman Empire, the Roman government that was persecuting their brothers. Okay, that's why all the Jews hated them. They hated tax collectors. Even worse, tax, tax collectors would then persecute Jews. They would take more money than was actually owed. They would steal. They would threaten. They were extortioners. And so we've already seen in Matthew, the Jewish leaders, they just would categorize tax collectors as sinners, just sinners. And Matthew was at one time one of them. But beyond this, we don't know much about him. He evidently ministered in Judea and went on from there, but no one can agree on exactly where he went. Again, both of these men incredibly ordinary, but also we, we see the more details we find out about these disciples, the more we learn they were weak. Matthew's life as a tax collector is a beautifully clear demonstration that Jesus came to save the sick, the lost, the wicked, not the squeaky clean. And Thomas, in his weakness, shows it's not the strength of our faith that makes us Jesus' disciple. No, Thomas didn't even go looking for Jesus, but Jesus went to Thomas. Both of these men were weak and ordinary disciples. And again, it's the weak and ordinary people that Jesus delights to call to himself. Next, Philip and Bartholomew. I got to pick up the pace here. Whew, a lot of names. Twelve. Can you believe it? Philip was a disciple of John the Baptist when Jesus asked him to follow him. And if you remember, Philip was the guy who went and told his friend Nathaniel. He said, we found him the, whom, whom the, uh, Moses and the law and the prophets wrote. He's saying, basically, we found the Messiah. Jesus of Nazareth is his name. And his friend Nathaniel says, could anything good come out of Nazareth? Okay, real buzzkill. So you remember that story? Well, most believe that Nathaniel also went by the name Bartholomew. And so that's likely who's, who Bartholomew is. And so it makes sense that these two would be paired together since they knew each other from before the whole disciple gig. But we don't know much at all about what happened to these guys, uh, especially Bartholomew. It's believed that Philip ministered in the Roman province of Asia. And you can actually go visit a, a tomb site, Philip's tomb uh, in Turkey at the Hierapolis. So your next vacation. 
Uh, but we really know nothing about Bartholomew uh, slash Nathaniel, other than he seems a little bit cynical, a little bit of a buzzkill, and that's really it on, on those guys. Now, these next four, uh, I've got four left and then Judas, they give us more glimpses into the weakness of the disciples. Now, we've met mostly ordinary, but now we get to meet the weak, certainly these two, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. These two brothers earned the nickname Sons of Thunder from Jesus, and that's not a good thing, okay? Jesus came up with that nickname for these guys probably due to their aggressive and loud temperament. They're just always thundering around with their opinions, okay? They were fishermen by trade, and their father Zebedee seems to have run a very successful fishing business because various stories in the Gospels make it seem like the Zebedee family is really well-connected, okay? And Matthew probably mentions Zebedee because people would be like, oh, yeah, Zebedee, I know that guy. He's the, big, he's the fishing guy, best fish this side of the Jordan or whatever. <laughs> it gives these stories sort of credibility by mentioning witnesses, especially respectable and successful witnesses, but these brothers, James and John, they left their father's successful fishing business to follow Jesus. And it's not like there was hard feelings because we also see their, their mother was also following Jesus with them. And she was probably supporting Jesus' ministry financially, it's believed. But these brothers are always getting into trouble together. Most of the stories in the Gospels about James and John highlight their weaknesses. For example, one time the Samaritan village tells Jesus that he can't stay there. He's not... He's not welcome there. And a normal person would be like, all right, I guess we'll stay somewhere else. But the sons of thunder are like, uh, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to consume the village? And Jesus, Jesus rebuked them. He's like, everything about you guys, just do something opposite, please. Another time they ask Jesus, they come up to him and they ask him if they can rule with him in the coming of his kingdom. They say, can we sit on your right and left hand? And some of the stories say that their mom was the one who asked Jesus. Sort of, They all came together with mom, which is it's just like, that lady sounds fun, okay? They say, can we, can we rule in your kingdom on your left and your right hand? They're trying to get, it's like treating the kingdom of God like it's a political, a position of power. And they're just trying to get into, you know, can we be your secretary of defense, secretary of state? You know, just trying to get their names in the hat early. So that's the sons of thunder. They're aggressive. They're impulsive. They're a little bit entitled. Their egos are overinflated, and the Gospels make them out to be weak and sinful men. And yet, who were Jesus's, some of his closest confidants? Who were in Jesus's closest circle of trust? James and John and Peter, who we'll cover in a minute. These men were weak, but Jesus embraced them, not because of anything in them, but rather because of the love and mercy Jesus shows to sinners. John went on to write the Gospel of John. James became the first of the apostles to be killed for his faith, which is recorded in the book of Acts. These men and their weakness, they proclaimed and demonstrated the love and mercy of God for sinners in remarkable ways. Do you know how John refers to himself in the Gospel of John? I love this. The way that John refers to himself in the Gospel of John, he'll talk about everybody else. Peter said this, and then Matthew said this, and this guy said this, and then the disciple who Jesus loved said this. That's how he refers to himself. James and John were weak, but their discipleship demonstrates the love of Jesus is strong. Lastly, of the good guys, it says, first Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. Now, Matthew isn't just saying first because Jesus is the first name he, he thought of. You know, it's not a coincidence. Like I mentioned, Peter is listed first because he became a leader among the disciples. He really took charge and kind of became the poster child for the disciples following Jesus' ascension into heaven. So that's why you'll find so many mentions of Peter in the New Testament because he was sort of the dude calling the shots. Now, we don't have a ton of information on Andrew. We know he and Peter were both fishermen. It seems like Andrew was actually the one who told his brother, Peter, about Jesus in the first place before Jesus had called them uh, to follow him. So, wow, Andrew, good job. But then he gets overshadowed <laughs> by Peter from there on out. He stays pretty quiet, and he seems to have been a rather ordinary but faithful disciple of Jesus. But Peter, on the other hand, he is uh, dynamic, okay, but not in a good way most of the time. We've got a lot of dirt on Peter in the New Testament. 
That's one of the biblical proofs that like Christianity is, is a true story because no one would write so negatively about their leader. Like it's like, who, where did this Christianity come from? Well, we heard it from this Peter guy and look at this book and it's like, wouldn't you make this guy look awesome? And he looks horrible. That's one of these like classical proofs like Christianity has to be real because no one would humiliate themselves by writing this way about their, their guy, their leader in the church. He's strong-willed, he's impulsive, he's extremely confident, even when he has no reason to be. But he's also a bit of a coward. It doesn't take much to break his faith, abandon all conviction when the going gets tough. And so just think of all the things Peter got to witness with his own eyes. He was in the room when Jairus' daughter was raised from the dead. He walked on water. Jesus one time filled his fishing nets with so many fish that he, he, it felt like the boat was going to sink. He saw Jesus transfigured on the top of a hill where Moses and Elijah also appeared. That's a crazy story. All the, it's incredible, all these signs that Peter witnessed firsthand. And yet, while Jesus is being tortured, before he's hung on the cross, what did Peter say when he was asked three times? He had three chances he was asked if he was a disciple of Jesus. He said, oh, no, I don't Never knew that guy. I don't know him. Peter was a weak man. He was constantly getting in Jesus' way. One time, Jesus was talking about how the Son of Man must suffer and die. Peter goes, no way. You don't know what you're talking about, Jesus. And he says, get behind me, Satan. One time, Jesus goes to show, demonstrate, this is how my disciples ought to be, loving servants, and he's going to wash their feet. Peter says, oh, no, you're not going to wash my feet. It's not going to happen. One time, when Jesus is being arrested, Peter starts swinging a sword around, cuts a guy's ear off. Jesus is constantly like, dude, everything about you just needs to stop. Stop being everything. Peter is a weak, sinful man. We have more stories of Peter's sin than any other disciple, including Judas. But again, recognize, like I've said again and again and again, who does Jesus call to himself? The weak and the ordinary. Who is listed first and foremost? the weakest Peter from a biblical account. Peter and all these disciples are exactly the type of people Jesus calls to himself, weak and ordinary. There's nothing extraordinary about any of them that set Christ's love on them. Rather, God delights to demonstrate his power by redeeming weak and ordinary sinners. Now, that being said, one last disciple, not listed first and foremost, but last and cursed most. Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Here's what we know about Judas Iscariot. Judas was evidently the, the keeper of the money for the 12 disciples. He was their treasurer, which is an office no one cares about until you have a bad one. And, and Judas was indeed that. The authors of the Gospels describe him as, as greedy. He's always looking for a way to fill his pockets with Money. He's always talking about how, oh, we should have given more money. You need to give me more money so I can distribute it to the poor because I really care about the poor. Give me more money. And, but he was taking it for himself. And his greed led him eventually to turn Jesus in to the chief priests so that they could arrest him. He, they gave Judas 30 pieces of silver in that deal. And that's about the, the price to purchase a slave. But Judas eventually, he regretted that decision. He regretted turning in Jesus. He regretted his betrayal. And so having come face to face with the reality of his weakness, he hung himself from a tree. He killed himself. And that was Judas's end. Judas, like the rest of the disciples, was weak and ordinary. But the question we have to ask then is this, what's the difference between a guy like Judas and a guy like Peter? Did Jesus call both of them to follow him? Yes. Were they both sinful and self-centered and arrogant? Yes. Didn't Peter even deny knowing Jesus the same night Jesus was betrayed? Peter betrayed Jesus too. Why is Peter first among the disciples, but Judas cursed and last of all? Have you ever thought about that? Let's talk about it. In the simplest of terms, the, the difference between Judas and Peter was that Judas was a hearer of the word only. Over time, Judas grew more and more comfortable with consuming the Christian faith rather than doing and living out the Christian faith. Because recognize, Judas was just as much a disciple as any of these other guys. He left everything 
to follow Jesus. Judas, in our passage today, is being given authority to cast out demons and heal sickness so he can go out with Simon the Zealot throughout towns and villages proclaiming the gospel and demonstrating that the kingdom of God is at hand. And Judas did all of that. Judas never had an asterisk by his name among the 12. But then what happened? Well, over time, Judas stopped doing the work that he was called to do and was content just to hear about the gospel rather than live it out. Now, what kind of work am I talking about? Things commanded of us like confess your sins to one another. Small, ordinary work like that. At some point, Judas began taking money for himself out of the money bag. And each day that he refused to confess his weakness for fear that that weakness would disqualify him from his position or might hurt his reputation, people might not trust him as a leader anymore, Each day that sin went unconfessed and unmentioned, those sinful habits grew more and more regular and more and more comfortable. Could you imagine what it would be like to be Judas after you've stolen money and you're having dinner with the disciples, you're sitting across from Jesus, this guy who's proven, oh yeah, he knows people's thoughts. I imagine you, that'd be terrifying. I'd be terrified to be found out. That sort of experience would make you second guess whether or not you wanted to keep doing that. That's a good kind of terror. That's called conviction. But Judas didn't stop. He just became numb to the conviction. So much so that as he sat in the Last Supper with Jesus and the other disciples, he'd he'd already made the deal with the chief priests to turn Jesus in. He already had money in hand from the transaction. And Jesus says, one of you in here will betray me. And Judas is so bold to ask the question, is it I? Is it me, Lord? That, that's a poker face. That sort of poker face, when confronted with your sin, is only the product of a slow, gradual, ordinary, but regular refusal to walk in the way Jesus has commanded. Which means Judas ought to serve as a, as a warning for you and I, like he is for all of church history. This is our final point today. We said, number one, Jesus' disciples are called to be doers of the word, not hearers only. Number two, Jesus' disciples are weak and ordinary. But the story of Judas shows us that number three, we must embrace our weakness and not neglect the ordinary works of faithfulness. That's not as clean of a statement as I tend to prefer, but here's what I mean by that. Judas couldn't embrace his weakness. He concealed it. He grew more and more comfortable with neglecting the ordinary works of faithfulness, like confessing your sin to one another that Jesus commands. That's how he became a hearer of the word only and stopped being a doer. We've got to embrace our weakness. That's why I've spent most of our time today convincing you the disciples were weak, sinful people just like you and I. Nothing's going to lure you away from doing what Jesus commanded you to do Nothing's going to lure you away from the ordinary works of faithfulness more efficiently than convincing yourself that it's not okay to be weak. We must embrace the reality that we are weak and that weakness is not the end of the world for anyone that Jesus has called to himself. The disciples, they're weak, and evidently that's okay. Other people can be weak and sinful. That's okay. Christ redeems them. But for some reason, the standard for you is higher. We convince ourselves that it's not okay to be weak. And that always leads to the neglect of basic works of faithfulness. Ordinary commands, Jesus gives, that seem small, but we see in the life of Judas, have huge consequences when neglected. Things like confessing sin. Why do we not like confessing and repenting of sins? Why is it so hard for us? Why do we instead try to justify ourselves or we make excuses? We say, oh, you don't know the circumstances. We try to minimize our sin. Well, because we're afraid. We're afraid that if we did confess our weakness, we'd lose our status. People would think less of us. People wouldn't trust us anymore. And we, God forbid, we'd be labeled a sinner. So then what do we do instead? We just don't confess stuff anymore. We just ignore that. We grow comfortable with a life of sparse repentance. I want us all, just for a moment, just imagine how freeing it would be instead to embrace the reality of your weakness. You imagine that sort of freedom where if you learn that someone thought something bad about you 
Instead of circling the wagons, preparing how to point out, well, all the wrong stuff that they're actually doing and find out a way to minimize your own weakness and rehearsing to yourself, what, oh, here's what I would say if someone asked me about it. Imagine if instead your first response was, yeah, that's true. I am weak. I am a sinner. That's a great label for me, a sinner. But thank God my worth isn't based on my righteousness. Thank God my value isn't derived from me. It's given to me by Christ and his righteousness. Doesn't that sound like a much lighter way to live? Maybe Jesus was on to something when he called his yoke easy and his burden light. But you'll never feel the lightness of Jesus' burden until you embrace your weakness. You'll never be a doer of the word so long as you're afraid of being weak along the way and doing it poorly, being found out to be weak. That's what keeps us from all sorts of faithful works, like reading our Bibles, prayer. We start doing it, we go, I'm not good at this. And so we stop. We hate that we're weak. So we just stop doing it. We must embrace our weakness and not neglect the ordinary works of faithfulness. I love Paul in 1 Timothy 1, 15 through 16. Listen to how he embraces his weakness. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. What's he about to say? Something really theological about God's eternality, how God's always faithful and his love never ends? That's what I expect when I hear those, that intro. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of who I am the foremost. But I receive mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost sinner, Jesus Christ might display, display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. Paul says, I want everyone to see how sinful I am so everyone looks at me and goes, wow, God is patient and desire that sort of relationship with God built on the weakness of humanity and the righteousness of Christ. Listen to Paul again in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. We read this this morning earlier in theological equipping class. You're like, it is the morning. <laughs> 2 Corinthians 12, 9, he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. How does the power of rest... Uh, power of Christ rest upon Paul through the boasting of his weakness, his sinfulness. So now as we turn to communion, I pray that we might boast in our weaknesses, the very means by which redemption and power of Christ comes to us. Christ doesn't save you because you're strong and you're extraordinary. He calls to himself the weak and the ordinary. He delights to redeem the lowly through his broken body and shed blood. And so we boast in our weakness. That is what we bring to the table of communion. You didn't bring the wine. You didn't bring the, the well, bread, but it's really a cracker. Uh, you didn't bring any of that. You know what you brought? Your sin, your weakness. Boast in that. And Christ provides the rest. Let's pray, prepare our hearts to boast in our weakness as we take communion together. God, we thank you that you're gracious. You're a gracious, loving Father, uh, we, like Israel, were all uh, lost. We were like sheep without a shepherd. And you provided for us your son, the good shepherd. I pray that we would follow him, that we would know his voice. We would delight in God's word. Pray that we would commune with you, Father, regularly in prayer. And that we would rely not on our strength, but on the power of your Holy Spirit. Apart from you, we can do nothing. I pray that uh, we would boast in this. Thank you for the grace of your son. Amen.